This Monday, schools nationwide will reopen, but are we ready for the new norm in education? Hello and welcome to On the Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. On New Providence, Abaco and in Eleuthera, schools will reopen for virtual learning and schools on other islands will open for face-to-face -face instruction. But this move has not been met without queries, outright defiance, and in some cases, constructive criticism. On tonight's episode of On the Record, Education Amidst a Crisis, we sit with the Chief of Education himself. Our discussion begins on the other side of this break. project actually pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a, um, at the conference, uh, uh, more at uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. Welcome back to On the Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. COVID cases hit the 4,000 mark this week, just as the Ministry of Education was preparing to open schools on October 5th. Education Minister Jeff Lloyd said by delaying the original start date, it allows the ministry and parents and caregivers the opportunity to secure the much needed devices for the full participation of all involved in the teaching and learning process. My guest for tonight, is the Honorable Jeff Lloyd, Minister of Education. Minister, welcome to On the Record. Thank you so much for joining us. How do you reassure parents that their kids are going to be safe? And how do you reassure teachers and administrators of their own safety come October 5th? Well, thanks a lot and good evening, everybody. Appreciate being here. Uh, this is the reason that in all of our circumstances where we cannot guarantee the uh, required prescription size mandated by the uh, health authorities. That school will be virtual for those students. The Abaco, Grand Bahama, New Providence, and parts of Eleuthera. Uh, because we have to ensure that there is safety in all of that which we do, Jerome. It's safety first, education always. Only in those situations where that uh, observances can be, such as the six feet, uh, the mask wearing, and so on, will there be face to face and so the majority of our students will be virtual that's number one number two our teachers then will be in an environment on the campuses where there are few persons except for their own colleagues they will be in individual classes or a library or a computer room where they will essentially be by themselves so that is really of no concern and persons who many educators who uh, uh, have certain comorbidities uh, will be with the permission of the administrators to be allowed to work from home as long as they can produce a medical certificate verifying those conditions so um, we we are observing as critically as we must in the educational establishment exactly what is prescribed by the health authorities now a part of this virtual learning means that students will have or must have access to certain devices what's the ministry doing to ensure that those that we get those proper devices in the hands of every single student that needs it. Well, as you would have heard me mention in the House of Assembly this past Wednesday, uh, and I've said this many times, and so have all of our uh, executives, the ministry is committed to ensuring that all of our students who need a device, as we have identified that need, will be provided to that, that, that device. And I have for you, you the benefit now of a particular device as an example that is going to be provided. Those students are the ones on the lunch voucher program and we have identified some 5,000 plus students so they will all be provided a device. The distribution of such devices have already begun particularly in the southern islands and those uh, devices will be distributed distributed to the students here in New Providence and the other family islands beginning this Saturday at any Alive store. So that's number one. Number two, in addition to devices, there are many students who also do not have internet access. That's why we are working with our care centers, churches who have committed to us that they will be able to provide uh, um, internet access access for those parents who wish to access those facilities. We also have our libraries where there are care centers. We also 
have urban renewal, some nine or so um, centers across the um, across New Providence certainly, that have uh, Wi-Fi access, which will be provided. We are partnering also, Jerome, you're happy to know that Cisco. Cisco has committed to providing Wi-Fi capability in 12 much needed areas here in New Providence and that facility and its installation is now being carried out and will be completed, I'm advised, sometime by next week. So the ministry is doing all that it can to assist those students who are in need to ensure that in this virtual space they can have access to quality education. Now, uh, of course, we have said many, many times to our parents uh, that we are in a different space, a different time. What you would have ordinarily invested in your child by way of school materials, textbooks, and so on, we are inviting you now to invest in an electronic device and to ensure that your home or wherever you are, reside would have uh, uh, internet capability of such a nature that the child would be able to access uh, the lessons on the learning ma management system of a virtual school or the school of their particular attendance in this time. Minister, what's the price tag on all of this? And, and who are your partners? Where are you getting help from? You mentioned Cisco, but what is all of this costing the ministry by extension, the taxpayers? And who are your corporate partners who are providing tablets, access, et cetera, uh, to you and, and by virtue to students? It's going to cost us uh, um, pretty close to $10 million because uh, in the first instance with regard to tablets, as well as for those students who are on the lunch program, we have to provide internet access. So we have collaborated with the uh, Alive and the BTC in the provision of tablets, both uh, for our educators as well as for our students. Uh, so it's gonna cost us up to 10, a uh, little north of $10 million. We have collaborated with many, many persons who have come forward and have invited us to join with them into securing um, support for our students. I want to mention a few for uh, for failure. I don't want to, you know, ignore many others, the churches, the Rotary Clubs of New Providence, of the Bahamas. Leno has come forward. I'm very grateful to Mr. Longley. Um, we have a number of businesses, corporate entities, private citizens who have come. Life at Key Foundation, as an example, have also um, made offers to us. The banks, Commonwealth Bank in particular, have made contributions and donations to us. I mentioned many of them, if not all of them, in the House of Assembly yesterday. And even up to this morning, the, uh, uh, there are many folks who are calling private citizens who would say, I would like to contribute a single device or 10 devices or five devices. Every member of parliament is making a donation of devices for members of their constituencies, as well as cabinet ministers. I am most impressed and very grateful for the outpouring of generosity across the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the assistance being given to the many students who would not have the ability at this time. To, now, Minister, uh, we, we've, to... we've talked about, if I can, we've talked about what, what will happen with the with the students and the devices. What about teachers? How are they being prepared? What are they being given to ensure that they're able to give um, the proper instructions and able to reach students? Same thing. They are also being provided with devices. Um, um, in, 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 our in, in, the, in the educators instance, and I say teach, when I say educators, I mean administrators as well as teachers. They will be provided with laptops. Um, and again, those laptops would be available for them at their respective schools. Now, we are working through the policy with the public service with regard to working from what we call working remotely. And as I indicated earlier, certainly those with comorbidities will have the opportunity if they present what is required to do so. But yes, the educators also are being provided with the facilities they need in order to conduct their um, educational uh, instructions. Uh, why is it, uh, you, you mentioned that we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, those islands that are going virtual and those islands that are allowing face-to-face, -face, why is it that Grand Bahama is among those being allowed uh, to go face-to-face -face or have face-to-face -face classes given um, the very high number of cases that they would have had on that island? And why is it that well, it it went vir completely virtual, if you could explain those? Well, it was, yes, well, we got a and are guided, uh, Jerome, by the medical authorities. We, our decisions are based on what we are given by the medical authorities. However, in Eleuthera, there are a couple of schools that will be going face-to-face. Um, -face. And again, 
The only way that you could go face to face is if you can assure, be assured, parents must be assured and the protection of students must be guaranteed that they can maintain the safe distance, they can maintain um, uh, the wearing of masks uh, throughout the school day. There are a number of schools in those family islands where, where that space is simply not available because of the number of students. Preston Albury is an example. Um, so that's number one. Number two, in Grand Bahama, uh, if you notice the past, I don't know, several weeks now, you would see that they have petered out in terms of the number of cases there. However, again, it is not possible because of the size of their school population to uh, issue Sure, that there would be a safe distance between students and so on and so forth. However, I wish to say further that there are a couple of schools in Grand Bahama where they can go face to face and they will be operating uh, in that fashion. What we do here, as I've said many times, and I've said in the House of Assembly several times, one size doesn't fit all. The district superintendents, along with the director and the principals, determine which schools can go face to face and which can't. And those that can, well, obviously, virtual. We've got to take a quick break in the show, but stay tuned uh, to our audience. We're going to continue our conversation, education amidst a crisis, right after this. Welcome to On the Record. Looking for more On the Record? If you miss our Thursday showing at 8 p.m., join us for the re-airing on Friday mornings at 10, and then again each Sunday night at 8.30. Or go to our YouTube channel and catch up on all of our past episodes. And then like our Facebook and Instagram pages for a preview of upcoming shows and get a chance to ask your questions. Just look for On the Record. You're watching On The Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. This segment is brought to you by our friends at Executive Printers. National examinations were also put off to the end of, put off during the end of the school year. Bahamas Union of Teachers leader, Belinda Wilson, has been very vocal about teachers' dismay and the way it was carried out. And tonight, we have just the man to answer some of those questions and queries. My guest tonight is a Minister for Education. Minister, in late September, it was reported that you'd refused to attend meetings with the BUT President Wilson and uh, her view as a credible representative or speak with her unless there was a credible representative, as you said, or unless she apologized for her conduct. Um, what is the status now of negotiations between you uh, or discussions between you and the BUT President? Are they still stalled? Are you still refusing to, to meet with her? Um, Jerome, I made a, 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 I sent a, a letter, uh, which the contents of which were um, unfortunately leaked to the public, I presume, and uh, the contents of that letter I stand by. What then, or how does that continue to affect the work of the Ministry of Education and the future of the teachers? Because if you're not talking to the union president, uh, you know, they're not in discussions. How is this affecting your ability to, to run education when, you know, the people that you need are your teachers? Our teachers are members of our, um, um, are in the employ of the Ministry of Education. We communicate with our teachers all the time. There is no in interference in the communication of our teachers. They are our employees. So we are in continuous conversation and direct conversation with our, with our teachers and all of our employees, educators, and so on. Uh, the Ministry of Education continues to uh, engage the Bahamas Union of Teachers. Nothing has changed there. So that continues. Nothing has changed. Just not with the president. Well, like I said, I wrote a letter and the contents of it is in the public domain and I stand by that. Does this or was this, has this served as a distraction um, to what, you know, to, to reopening school? Considering everything, this is not a normal year. There's so much going on. We're in different circumstances and you have this going on where you and the union president aren't talking, you know, through official channels. Has this served as a distraction? 
It, not distraction to us. I mean, we continue to do what is required. I just an, uh, answered in a first segment to all of that which we are doing. School is going to open on October the 5th. As I indicate in the House of Assembly on Wednesday past that there will be a week of national orientation to ensure that all of our students are ready uh, to engage the environment in which they now must exist. And um, we, we are not distracted in the least. We have work to do, and that work is being done. This part, this weekend, uh, the examinations will essentially be over. I think next week it's only about one or two days in which there are some practical exams. And the, uh, the, the markers have already been marking, and, and they will conclude that marking within a month or so, and the results are out. We continue to do what we have to do. I want, to talk about, I want to talk about national exams with this very quickly, and then we're going to move on from this. Can you give us an assurance, though, that the concerns of the teachers will still be heard? I mean, the unions are there to bring forward, grie bring forward grievances and deal with issues. Can you assure us that the concerns of teachers are still being heard? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's an open door policy here with every single supervisor that teachers have. Teachers are able to report to their heads of the department, or they can report to their senior master mistress or they can report to the vice principal or the principal or the district superintendent or the deputy directors and the director and the permanent secretary and the minister. Not a problem. There is no blockage whatsoever in any channel uh, with respect to the teachers. None no, whatsoever. But, uh, and I get that. There's, there's, no, yeah. there's no interruption. There's no interruption with the, uh, with, with the relationship between the Bahamas Union of Teachers and the Ministry of Education. We take you at your word, sir. Um, what has been the turnout what's the turnout been like uh, for national exams you mentioned that they are wrapping up of course these are the exams from the last school year that have been delayed on two occasions but what's been the turnout um thus far and what's been the ratio been, or what's the ratio been like for private uh versus the public schools i don't have the specifics of that right now um Jerome, but I do know that about um earlier part of the exam schedule meaning about a, a week ago i'm advised that it was up to about 75 to 80 percent of the students registered for the exam had in fact turned up to take those exams. Our responsibility is to make access uh, available to students who want a quality education and examinations is one such means by which they can gain the criteria they need in order to uh, negotiate the rest of their lives. Exams are not mandatory. If you want to take them, you take them. If you don't, you don't. But we must make available and access to those examinations. The same way that other countries around the world have made access available for their examinations, we have done the same thing in the Bahamas. And I said in the House of Assembly that if there was any interruption in this particular iteration of the exams, then it would be canceled because we were not going to go through this any further. The school year has to go on. Um, is there any, or in marking these national exams, any consideration being given in terms of the, of the grading curve uh, considering all that students have had to endure, uh, the methods of learning, uh, things of that nature, are those things being taken into consideration uh, in the marking of these exams or in the grading, Every, I should say? Everything mentioned has been considered and there has been a, a decision that there will be no curve. However, those students, and there are many who would have been affected by um, you know this virus, whether it's because they had to set up as a quarantine, a person in their house, parent, and others, and so on. Up to the point of that examination, um, uh, they would have received their particular grade. And if, say, for instance, a subject area, let's say English, they would have only been able to complete three out of the uh, um, uh, five papers, uh, say, in English. Then the other two papers, according to the grades that that student would have been receiving in their school up to that point, would be the grade that they would be considered to have received for those remaining papers. So yes, we have given consideration to all uh, possibilities. Don't forget, Jerome, we are in collaboration and constant communication with the examination systems across the globe. Uh, Cambridge, which of course is the one that we have the most intimate relationship with, UNESCO, the Caribbean Council of Examinations, and so on. <clears throat> so we are in line with essentially what is happening all around the globe. Uh, now, I want to talk about those students who didn't do the national exams, you know, your end of end of year average or end of year grade, those things determine a lot of things, your, your you know, your ability to move up and that kind of thing. It affects your overall average. You know, how would those kinds of things, you know, how, how would how would the averages handled, the grading handled and, and why not go with the predictive grades, as some would have suggested? 
Well, because school continued on the virtual platform uh, since March the 17th. School continued. And again, in those circumstances where for any reason a student was not able to participate in the virtual school, let's say, for instance, because of the, no device or no internet, and that could be verified, then a predictive grade is, 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 um, is, is awarded. However, that uh, is in the minority, far the minority of circumstances that we have found, because as I would have indicated again, some 48,000 students participated on the virtual platform. Only six or 7,000 of those were private school students, which means that a great majority of our public school students participated in the virtual school and in school. And don't forget, Jerome, and any circumstance where we are face to face, there are a whole lot of students who don't come to school. Even though their school is right there, they could easily walk to school or catch the bus for any number of reasons. They just don't bother to come to school. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, truancy um, is a is a long-standing problem, whether we were in COVID or not. So certainly, if they weren't coming to, to brick and mortar, you can only imagine not coming to, to virtual school. So we've got one more break, a few more things to discuss in this program. We're inviting our audience, stay with us. We're going to continue with on the record right after this. Welcome to On the Record and the balanced, true, and open debate you've been looking for. Welcome back. You're watching On the Record. Tonight, we cover education amidst a crisis. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. And my guest tonight is the Minister of Education, the Honorable Jeff Lloyd. Minister, I want to focus a bit in this segment on the lunch program and the students that will be in need that are in a need of that are in need of assistance how is that being done how are they getting how are these students getting what they need from the from the lunch program they uh, will receive the devices as i indicated and will continue to receive vouchers for um, food assistance at this time now because they're at home we just simply call it food assistance so we Every two weeks, they will be provided with um, vouchers to be redeemed at a variety of stores for food assistance. Nothing changed. Yes. You know, this is obviously um, still very new in many ways, but this is something that the ministry has been moving towards with virtual learning and virtual education. How is this going to now affect the way that we teach students going forward? Things are changing. This is not, you know, I read a piece last night, I think, in The Economist. People need to get to understand that the world has changed and it will never go back to what you may have been accustomed to some time ago. I'll give you a very quick example. I walked into a particular bank yesterday to withdraw some cash and the bank told me this is not a, uh, this is a cashless bank. You ever heard anything like that? This is um, a cashless A cashless <laughs> bank, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is a cashless bank. Yeah, you heard money, anything like that? Money, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, it is. It is. It does speak to that's, the time. And and you say that. And you say you, you say that, sir. And we're talking about education. Um, and there are still so many people who would not understand that or may not even have access, you know, to, to their cash if they were told that. So this now speaks to the 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 digital divide. Um, and in light of the economic conditions uh, that we are facing now. Uh, the already we already had a large digital divide. How do we begin to bridge that gap between those who have access and those who don't? Because the reality is, if you don't have access, uh, there are a lot of things that there are a lot of doors that are closing for you and things that you can't be done. I want to speak though in the educational context. What are we doing to bridge that gap and close that divide? Just like I said earlier, Jerome, every single one of our schools is a smart school. Every single one of the ministry's educational buildings is this is a smart building. We are putting devices in the hands of every single student who needs it. We are making available Wi-Fi free areas across the island of New Providence with the assistance of of Cisco, some 12 very important areas, particularly where we have what you might consider folks of certain social 
socioeconomic profile. Every single one of our libraries is going to be Wi-Fi. As much as possible, the uh, Ministry of Education is making available uh, the government of the Bahamas Wi-Fi access for all of our students to the extent and the degree that is possible. All of the private schools have now contacted the internet providers to upgrade their facilities so that their students can get access and can retain that access throughout the duration of their instructions. And, and as time moves on with the I, um, uh, BTC and Cable Bahamas, as time moves on, they themselves are expanding their broadband so that the difficulties with dropped um, access or uh, insufficient access will be a thing of the past. And that's happening as we now speak. Come Monday morning, we are moving by from 1G, I am advised, to 3G in the uh, broadband capability of BTC and Alive so that our students can have access. My final question, sir, are our teachers keeping pace? I know that the kids, you know, I know in this virtual environment, the kids will get it immediately. Are our teachers keeping pace? We're moving away from those textbooks now. Um, and when I say teachers, I also mean the curriculum. Are we keeping pace with what our kids need and, and how they're learning? No, no, no question about it. We have had now going on for several weeks training for all of our educators. And I say educators, Jerome, as a term because it includes the administrators as well. Every single body has been trained and has acted access to all of the uh, training materials and they can go and access that at any time and as often as they would like. That's number one. Number two, we have been now for the past three years in a revisionist mode with our curriculum because we know and understand that you must make your curriculum relevant to the 21st century. Uh, gone are the days when you know you could kind of just give a generic bit of information to our people. No, it has to be relevant. It has to be applicable on day one. The minute they walk out school, they got to be able to apply the skills and the knowledge they have learned. Absolutely. Minister, thank you very much. We are unfortunately out of time. This is an abbreviated show tonight because we are preparing, of course, for a program that's coming right up after this um, that the Ministry of Education is hosting. So thank you very much, sir, for spending this time with us this evening. Best of luck to you um, and the, the, the hundreds and, and thousands within the educational system as they prepare now to go back to begin a new school year amidst this pandemic. So best of luck to you and certainly best of luck to the teachers and students out there for the coming year. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that's going to do it for our show tonight, Education Amidst the Crisis. Special thank you to my guest, Minister Jeff Lloyd, and to my technical and production teams. Thank you again for joining us. We'll be back same time, same place right here on The Record. See you.